20th, my name is Ann Guinea, and we're meeting again with Tom Theobald of NIWAC. Tom is in his honey house once again and demonstrating how he gets candles. Tom, I'll let you take over from here. The uh, beeswax <clears throat> is a byproduct of the honey harvest. The Honeycomb has to be uncapped so that the honey can be extracted from the comb. And the cappings are new each year. The bees create those cappings new each year. And although it's essentially pure, it has to go through a final purification process to be ready for candle making. We'll harvest about two or three pounds of beeswax for every hundred pounds of honey that we produce. And traditionally, beeswax has been used, one of the major uses, uses has been for candle making, and it's been the premier candle wax for tens of thousands of years, and uh, at one time was the ultimate in lighting technology. Before the discovery of electricity, candles were a major source of illumination at night and in the winter. And, for example, in England, in <clears throat> medieval England, there was a company called the Worshipful Manu Candle Manufacturers or something to that effect, and they were sort of like a public utility as today. They controlled the manufacture of beeswax candles, and there was another company that controlled the manufacture of tallow candles, which is what the the poorer classes got. Tallow candles are made from animal fat and they smoke and stink and the well-to-do people used beeswax. Beeswax has largely been replaced in the candle making world by paraffin which is a byproduct of oil refining but the uh, the problem with paraffin candles is they burn much more quickly and they emit uh, hydrocarbons just the way an internal combustion engine would. And if you have a, a fair number of candles burning in the house, it's sort of like having your lawnmower idling in the living room. I have a customer in Arizona who loves candles, but her son is hypersensitive to a variety of things. and she can't burn regular candles in the house or he'll react to them but she can burn beeswax candles so what we're doing here today is we're making a candle run and we start with what are called dipping frames and those are designed to hold the wick rigid until you get a candle it's about pencil size. Then they're cut away from the dipping frames and they'll hang free and be dipped to completion from there. It takes about 18 to 20 dips to finish a candle. And these candles will be 7 eighths at the base, which is a standard size for a dinner taper. The uh, dipping frame is something that I made myself and uh, they can be purchased for people who are doing a few candles one of the things that they may do to keep that candle rigid initially is to tie a large nut to the metal nut to the bottom of the wick to hold the wick straight and then when they reach the point where that's no longer needed then they cut that portion of the wick away That's not very efficient for the number that we're doing. And what I'm doing now is I'm cutting them away and I'll cut the wicks away from all these dipping frames and then we'll continue dipping from there. There are some other pieces of equipment that are in use here. One is a, a standard commercial double boiler on the hot plate and a commercial crock pot and the 
double boiler melts the wax and the, the uh, crock pot is sort of my buffer. That's where I accumulate the wax to replenish the dip tank, which is where the candles are actually dipped. Early in the process, I can, well, I can melt wax faster than I need it. But as the candles grow, they take increasingly larger amounts of wax with each dip. And so the buffer is provides for that point at which I'm using wax faster than I can melt it. What kind of string are you using? <laughs> yeah, I had a uh, beekeeping class two weeks ago and afterwards we talked a little bit about the candle making and one of the people said to me, how do you make all that wick? <laughs> well, actually, wick is very specialized, and there are many, many different kinds of wicks, different braids and different plates, different, like, different plates of, of different size thread. And the wick is uh, purchased from an, a commercial manufacturer in, in Seattle. And the wick is designed so that it's sized to the to the type of wax and to the size of the candle. And if the wick is properly matched to the candle, the wick as it burns should bend slightly in sort of a comma shape. And what this does is that puts the tip of the wick at the edge of the flame, the outside edge of the flame, which is the hottest part, and it will burn away completely. If the wick stands too straight, then the tip of the wick is in the center of the flame where it's cool, and you'll get a flame that develops a large carbon cap and smokes, and uh, just isn't very satisfactory. So the balance between the wick and the wax is really an important point in candle making, and it's one that most candle makers, even commercial candle makers, frequently miss. And almost everybody has bought candles at one time or another, and either the wick winds up drowning in the wax for larger candles, or the wick smokes and flickers and flares up and dies down. And that's just a sign that the wick is not either satisfactory work or it's not matched to the wax and the size of the candle. When did that technology be, get discovered? That's been within the last uh, 150 years, although wick has been used for thousands of years, various kinds of wick. Um, for example, early, early on the Egyptians would use uh, papyrus reeds as a wick and they would dip those into the wax. Um, but the, can, the candle wick as we know it today is a fairly recent invention and uh, it's a combination of the weaving of the wick itself and the pickling of the wick so that when the candle is extinguished the wick doesn't continue to, to burn. That's why in the old days candles were snuffed periodically and the snuffing we think of snuffing today as being putting the candle out, but actually snuffing is trimming the wicks. And when the candle <clears throat> when the candle was extinguished, the tip of the wick had to be clipped off, or it was liable to continue to burn with just a like an ember down to the top of the candle, so that the next time the candle was lit, you'd have to carve away a portion of the candle to expose some of the wick. By pickling the wick in mineral salts, it prevents that, that afterglow, and uh, you get the kinds of wicks that we have today, where you blow it out and you have a little wick left, and the next time you light it up, you're ready to go. The top bars on these wicks, like most of the things involved with beekeeping, have a story. They uh, are made from a walnut tree 
that stood on the site of the Justice Center. In the old days, for people who lived in Boulder for years, they'll remember when that was the ruins. There were various hotel projects that were attempted on that site, never uh, successfully. In the 60s, it was the home to some of Boulder's famous hippies. And uh, a friend of mine bought a walnut tree that had been taken down when they finally be began to build the Justice Center. And we milled that into a variety of things. And some of the last of it I glommed on to for the top bars for my dipping frames. So there's a little history even to the, to the dipping frames. The rack that the candles are on is an antique clothes dryer for drying your clothes in front of the fireplace or the wood stove and it belonged to Barbara's grandmother. Beekeepers are notorious for adapting equipment on hand for their purposes. I found later after I'd glommed onto this that uh, they do indeed make these or used to make these kinds of things for candle dipping and they're called candle wheels. So this is my version of the candle wheel. Now we're at a point here where we're going to have to take a little break as we remelt the bottom portion of the dipping frames and then we'll be ready to dip again. The dip frames, the bottom of the dip frames accumulate wax at the same rate that the wick does. So they have to be remelted in order to be ready for the next dipping. And uh, rather than have a separate tank, I just utilize the dip tank and remelt them in the dip tank. Then they get hung and this afternoon when I come back to re string the wicks, the dipping frames, they'll be ready to go. I can only do three sets at a time because of the, the t cutting away and so as soon as I've taken these three sets out I'll dip around and then the other three will go in to be melted down and I'll dip, a and I'll dip around to draw the wax back down in the dip tank so that it doesn't get overfilled. These are all little techniques that I've worked out over the years that speed the process and make it more efficient. The dip tank sits in a 10 gallon water heater that I've cut a slot out of the top of to receive the dip tank. Um, you can buy these, but they aren't uh, to my specifications for the process that I use. So I've had to make most of this equipment myself. Well, um, it just sort of appears each year. I've been doing this, when I first started to do it, I did it just because I had the wax. I had a little time in the fall. I knew that beeswax candles were nice, and, and honestly, I wanted an excuse to stay up all night and enjoy the full moon. So 
I'd start warming things up. I put together all the equipment that I needed. It wasn't as as efficient as what we have here today, but I'd start warming things up in the afternoon and about the time the sun was setting I'd start dipping and I'd dip through the night. It'd take about 12 hours and when I got burned out on the dipping I'd step outside for a few minutes and enjoy the full moon and get a breath of fresh air and then go back to the dipping and and uh, my intention was just to I'm going to have to stop here because I have to count. Give a few pair to friends and the people that I have bees with. and My customers are the ones who really educated me as to the, the value of beeswax candles. And I started to get requests for a few pair here and a few pair there and I began to learn a little bit more and before I knew it my uh, recreation had become my winter job. It appears to me that the candles are changing color. And when the wax is hot when they first emerge from the dip tank they're almost white and as they cool the color will deepen. The natural color of beeswax is uh, anywhere from a light lemon yellow to a deep orange and that's in part a result of the the pollens of the nectar sources. The pollen traces in the wax will tend to color it so if for example the bulk of the honey has come from a floral source that has a deep orange pollen that will be reflected in the beeswax. What pollen would make bright orange? Oh there are a lot of you'd be surprised. Uh, I trap pollen occasionally. You collect it daily And it's like a kaleidoscope. And you'll see, for example, the predominant pollens are yellows and oranges. But you'll see, a, for example, maybe a blood red pollen up here. And over a period of days, the quantity may grow as that plant comes into bloom and then diminish perhaps to be replaced by maybe a deep purple and some pollens are even black if you think about poppies if you have poppies in your flower beds the pollen from poppies is very dark but the predominant colors are yellows and oranges Each dip will add at this point about a 32nd of an inch and as we get toward the end closer to a 16th of an inch. And the dipped candles are actually superior although you don't find dipped candles, true dipped candles much anymore because of the time involved. The dip candles are actually a superior candle because they're much stronger. That's as a consequence of the layering. It's like lamination of wood. And a candle that's properly done, you could have a 30-foot candle in a draft-free environment. The draft, a draft can really uh, change the burning characteristics but a, in a draft free environment you could have a 30 foot candle and light it and it would burn all the way to the bottom without a single drip consuming both the wax and the wick 
until finally at the bottom you had a small spot of beeswax and a little charred piece of wick left. The interesting thing is this, the circle that's created in my view because the wax is really a, a creation of the bees of a substance that's origin was sunlight. The plant captures the sunlight, the plant creates nectar, the bees gather that nectar as their food source. The, the conversion of nectar to honey is called elaboration. They go through another step of elaboration, which is the young bees consume beeswax. They consume about seven pounds of beeswax to produce a pound of, or seven pounds of honey to produce a pound of beeswax. And they extrude that in little flakes between their abdominal segments, and that's what's used to create the honeycomb. We come along and we harvest the beeswax and re we refine it and we turn it into candles. And when we burn those candles, we release that sunlight that was captured on some summer day. And we release that energy back into the cosmos and someday it'll come back to us as candles maybe, but that's the whole process. The light that's emitted by a beeswax candle is sunlight that was captured by a plant system on a summer day. Okay, we're at another break point. We'll have to let those melt down. Would you like me to read one? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it says, Pure Beeswax, Hand Dip, Niwot Honey Farm, Niwot, Colorado. For hundreds of years, beeswax was the only wax available for candles. It is still regarded as the premier wax for candle making as it has a high melting point and burns slowly with a white smokeless flame. Several hundred pounds of honey will yield only a few pounds of fine new cappings wax, the wax caps which are removed from the comb so the honey can be extracted. In the past, beekeepers reserved cold winter evenings after the harvest for candle dipping. Few do today, but we still follow this tradition because we feel that hand-dipped candles are the most exquisite use for our beeswax. Only new unbleached wax is used and each candle requires about 18 individual dips. Hand-dipped beeswax candles add an elegant touch to a special evening. They represent many miles of foraging among summer flowers by the bees and provide both light for the eye and warmth for the spirit when the snow flies outside. They are a special gift of nature reflecting a time when life was less complicated and our ties to the earth more direct. Amen. <laughs> One of these dinner tapers will burn for about uh, nine hours. Now, a dinner taper is how many inches? It's about 12, 12 inches. Now, if this were a paraffin candle, <laughs> you might get uh, an hour. 
or sometimes less. So there are some practical reasons for beeswax candles. Um, it is a very high quality candle wax. They do burn longer. But uh, that's just really to satisfy the practical side of our nature. The real reason for burning beeswax candles are aesthetic. There's something just very soothing and mellowing about the light from a beeswax candle. They do have a wonderful fragrance and they're just lovely to have around. So you can justify it with practical reasons if you need to, but that's not really the reason for beeswax candles. I used to do each of these labels by hand, if you can believe it, before I was doing as many candles as I'm doing now. You mean you hand wrote each I one? hand wrote every one of them. It didn't have the verbiage, but it had the Niwot Honey Farm hand dipped candles. And uh, I soon uh, outstripped that little procedure. And I have people who at this time of the year will begin to surface. They'll call and they know that this is candle making time and they'll get their year's supply of candles. They may get a dozen, two dozen. I've had individuals get as many as four dozen pair and they keep them on hand for themselves. They use them as house gifts and they just like to have them around. So you don't know today how many candles you will sell this season? No. I just try to anticipate at this time of the year I try to anticipate and build up a little backlog because <clears throat> I know that as we approach the holidays the orders will come in faster than I can make the candles and up until two or three years ago it was primarily a holiday thing and I would put the candle making equipment away after Christmas and that would be the end of it but now it carries over into the first of the year and uh, I, I'll uh, usually do the last of the candles on those last cold days of March and build up an inventory and try to anticipate what the demand is going to be through the summer. The Niwot market uh, has become kind of a, a focal point for the candles and the honey and people have gotten in the habit of going to the Niwot market. So. I try to keep the Niwot market stocked with candles at least through a portion of the summer and then when we're out we're out and uh, they have to wait until fall again. You do every step yourself, don't you? Well, you know like a lot of other small businesses you can't really hardly afford to pay yourself you certainly can't afford to pay anybody else so yeah I do everything with the candle making and the beekeeping it's pretty much a one-man operation Barbara will help with the beekeeping occasionally if I get behind particularly in the spring um, she'll help in the fall with the bottling on occasion because it really speeds it up if we have two people when we're bottling and because of the way I do the honey, I have to put it in the containers that it's going to stay in at harvest time. I don't have the luxury of running it off in 5-gallon buckets or 55-gallon drums and then liquefying it later and repackaging it. So harvest time is a, is a very labor-intensive period for this kind of operation. I often think as I'm doing this what uh, 
evenings these candles will grace, you know, and where they'll go. I know they go all over the country. Some of them may go all over the world, and they'll probably be used largely for special dinners or special occasions, and I just like to kind of think about where they're going to go. What I'll do now is I'll restring a couple of the dipping frames and uh, I do that each afternoon after I've wrapped all the candles so that the dipping frames are ready to go in the morning when I get over here. I usually get here oh, between 5.30 and 6 in the morning. This, uh, I'll just show you, <laughs> that's the throw out bearing out of my truck, <laughs> the old one. See beekeepers are great at adapting what's at hand to fit their needs. Okay. That's a four pound spool of wick. When you buy wick in larger quantities, you buy it by the pound. That'll, uh, that'll make about between 2,500 and 3,000 candles. When I start in the morning, each of these dipping frames will go into the dip tank and they'll sit for about five minutes. And the reason for that is to saturate, to fully saturate the wick with wax. And uh, <clears throat> while that's, there's obviously a certain amount of waiting time, and that's when I read the morning paper and eat my breakfast. And uh, by the time I'm done soaking the wicks on all six dipping frames, then it's time to go to work and I'm done with the paper and done with breakfast. Tell me when you're ready. At one time, this was a, a fall activity for anyone rural, certainly, <coughs> to make candles for the winter candle supply, um, typically out of tallow, but if there was beeswax available, they'd be made out of beeswax, and uh, just like they would can the summer's produce for winter, they'd make a year's a winter supply or a year's supply of candles.
we're filming in the last of November and it's almost 70 degrees outside and your beehive is buzzing with activity today. Where are those bees? What are those bees going to do? There are no blossoms now. When will they go hibernate or what? what well, they, they never do? hibernate. They're active throughout the winter if the temperature is over 50 degrees. And while there are no flowers in bloom, we could go out there, in fact, we'll go out there when we're done taping and take a look, and I would be willing to guess if they've been flying at all, they may not have been because of this wind, but you'll see an occasional bee come in with a little pollen, scrounged it up somewhere, and even in the middle of winter in January, when you would think that there's nothing out there, when we get a warm day, you can go out and you'll see a, an occasional fielder coming in with a little pellet of gray pollen on each hip. Probably has about as much nutritional value as house dust, but they've found it somewhere. And they need to take a constitutional periodically. They're very fastidious insects and they won't defecate in the hive. So if they're confined for a couple of weeks, they're taking to the air with great relief. <laughs> So here's the dipping frame, and dipping frames can come in all shapes. This uh, holds 10 candles, five on each side, <clears throat> and then I'll dip this until I get a candle that's about pencil size, and then the bases are clipped away, and the top bars come apart so that I have five candles hanging from each top bar, and then the dipping continues from there. <clears throat> 